All right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the session on climate change and carbon policy. My name is Christian van Hirschhausen from Berlin University of Technology and DIW, and I have the pleasure to uh, <coughs> convene this session. I used to consider myself an energy and infrastructure economist, but now I'm told I'm a climate economist. So uh, I guess many of us share this uh, destiny. And uh, <coughs> we were just talking before whether this is an old topic or a new topic. For some of us, it's an old topic, but for some of you, probably it's a new topic. So. Uh, it's climate change and carbon policies. A couple of weeks ago, actually, I thought this would be a, a, a rather um, uninteresting session and nobody would attend. I'm, I'm very glad that there are so many of you in this room, but then things happened in Beijing. Some announcements from, <coughs> from conferences, etc. Pe people started to get interested in what happens in, in the United States because President Obama made some statements and of course we're, we're still out on the uh, EU assessment on the 2030 strategy and, and, and the 40% objective. So after all this is an exciting topic and an exciting session. Um, and actually what we want to discuss about different approaches to climate and carbon policy in three different regions of the world. We'll start off in, in Europe, then move on to Asia and, and finish in, in the United States. We want to talk about issue linking <coughs> issues because carbon policy is not a specific policy, it's a complex policy. It involves different ministries, finance ministers becoming interested, infrastructure ministers, etc. Um, and it's, it, it's increasingly seen as a complex policy to solve different issues. And we're also, even though this is not the focus of this session, we're also inter interested in the international dimension, looking forward to the Conference of Parties in, in Paris in the fall next year. But I think we're here mainly <coughs> to take stock and look uh, towards the future with uh, three important <coughs> regions, and of course there are other important regions, we just talked about in the concurrent session about the Latin American experience, and I'm very glad that we have three distinguished speakers that I'll announce sequentially. So actually we'll, we'll have the European session and then the uh, China session and then the, <coughs> then the US session. So let me start um, introducing um, Danny Ellerman who needs no introduction because not only <coughs> he's a long-standing member of IAE but all, he was also his president in 1990. Um, Danny Ellerman was until recently a professor of at the Climate Policy Unit at the European University Institute. Before he was senior lecturer <coughs> at MIT and executive director of CEPR and the Joint Program on Science and Policy of Global Change. And he has 18 years experience down in DC, both in consulting <coughs> but also in, in, in public service, um, <coughs> serving uh, mainly the Carter administration and and for me knowing Danny for a long time he's he's Mr. Cap and Trade starting with the SO2 experience and then going on to the CO2 and probably continuing to to Nox and Mercury trading um, so uh, we're looking forward to having your assessment from your experience in Florence on the European experience but of course in the wider context thanks for being here Danny Okay, thank you very much for those kind words, Christian, and it's a pleasure to be back at one of the IAEE conferences that I must confess having missed a few of them, but uh, it is a pleasure to be back. So my task, as Christian said, is to talk about EU climate policy as one of the major regions of the world that has adopted climate policy. Uh, what I'm going to do is, one, give you a description of what uh, I would call EU climate policy and what Europeans uh, call their climate policy as it stands now. Go through a little bit of what has been achieved, how, this, how things have evolved. I'm gonna talk mostly about the ETS, that's what I know best, but also talk about other features of it, and some of the lessons and things that we don't know about it. And then finally, where things are headed, or what's the longer term outlook in terms of climate policy uh, in Europe. Uh, now, the existing policy is has the catchy 
title that's been emphasized many, many times of 2020 by 2020. A little bit too cute, but nevertheless, one that's easy to remember. Uh, and the three 20s, uh, initial 20s, refer to, first of all, a 20% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels. And this is to be accomplished by two instruments. One is the emission trading system, which I think everyone is familiar with. Uh, and it applies to the power and the large, uh, large industrial sources, and it is commonly called the flagship or the centerpiece of EU climate policy. But a very important part and much less noticed is what's called the effort sharing uh, uh, effort, effort sharing uh, uh, program or uh, requirements which are also binding on the member states, not on individual firms, as is the ETS, but it essentially applies to the non-ETS sector. So there are differentiated targets for every member state and that it must, its non-ETS emissions must uh, be no higher than a certain level. There's a certain amount of government trading, some offset use that's allowed and so forth, uh, but that's uh, uh, called the effort sharing agreement. And between those two, uh, they would, of course, assuming the effort sharing uh, has the same success as the ETS in terms of lowering emissions, uh, that will achieve that 20% reduction. The second 20 is the 20% share of renewable energy, 20% uh, yeah, share of energy consumption throughout the EU. This is likewise to be achieved by targets, differentiated targets on each of the member states as to what is the percentage of their consumption that needs to be from um, renewable energy that takes into account their renewable energy sources such as hydro uh, currently and what could be reasonably achieved and whatever negotiations went on in that. Uh, but that's, anyway, that's 20% share of renewable energy. And then the third is a 20% uh, improvement in energy efficiency. Uh, now, of these, the last is not legally binding in the European Union's legal structure, meaning that member state or firms or member states, as the case may be, could not be taken to court and enforcement proceedings uh, taken against them uh, if, if they were not met. That applies to the 20% share of renewable, the renewable targets, it applies for the effort sharing uh, program and of course for the ETS. There is also, you'll hear a great deal about the 2050 roadmap which anticipates or foresees an 80% reduction of emissions by 2050. And this is just what it says, it's a roadmap. Uh, it is not mandatory, it's not, it hasn't been translated into legislation, uh, it's, it's a plan, if you wish. And of course the first step, and it's to be achieved by steps along the way, which 2020 is just one of those steps and the current debate concerns 2030, Presumably there will be a debate on 2040 and 2050 as well. And if you follow the European debate at all closely recently, you've heard a lot about backloading, which is a fairly technical term. And it, it basically were initially the auction permits in the third period were to be front loaded uh, because of the low price and the assumed effect of not auctioning as many. Uh, allowances, there's an attempt to actually backload the distribution of the auctioned allowances by, by controlling the, the numbers of what would be auctioned, although the overall amount for the whole eight years of this third period uh, will remain the same. So, as I said, I'm going to focus mostly on the ETS, so let me show you some pictures of just how things go. I would point out this is the only single price in the European Union single economic market. I have an outstanding offer to anyone of a nice meal, wherever you want, if you can identify one other uniform price throughout the European economic area. So far, I've been making this offer for almost 10 years now, no one has taken me up on it. But it is, it is the same price in Bulgaria, in the Netherlands, in Estonia and Spain, you know, you name a country, it's the same price uh, everywhere. Of course, there are no transportation costs, it's a, it's a bookkeeping convention. I would note three things about just the, this is a graph you'll see many, many times, this happens to be the prompt forward, uh, which is the thickest market. And you'll notice that there's a red and a blue line. The red line is the first period, the trial period, 
in which banking was not allowed or there was no banking or carryover permits into the next period, as it turned out, there were more permits than there were emissions, although by a very small margin. But nevertheless, that meant surplus permits and a price of zero. And the blue line represents the what we can call the post phase one price, uh, which banking is now permitted across all the various periods into which the trading system is, is called. And you'll see this price actually starts out in 2005 and continues. The three things I would note is it is a price that reflects things going on elsewhere as well as unique features of the ETS. So if you look at the end of 2008, you'll see a sharp fall in prices. If you remember, this was not the only asset price that fell significantly in the latter part of 2008. It reflects a common feature that we saw in many, many different asset values. Other features here are unique to the ETS, but it reflects, you know, it's an interrelated market with other commodities and, and naturally reflects what's going on in those other markets. Also, there has been a general demand. If you look at the second period price, Initially, prices were much higher than what people expected. The usual expectations were that the price would be around 10 euros a ton if you went back to 2004, 2005, just before it was implemented. And you can see, indeed, the very first quotes in 2005 started out there. <clears throat> but initially, the argument was very much, why is the price much higher, even getting up as, as high as 30 euros? But you can see over time, there's been a general downward uh, decline. A lot of that has to do with the, the Great Recession and other economic things, but uh, you know we could talk. That's a, that's another subject. And last, I would point out for anyone who doubts that expectations clearly count in price formation. This is a point I'll come back to, but I think is too often overlooked in the European system. And look at the end of 2007, the the price on settlement uh, for the end of 2007 allowances was essentially zero, while the price for 2008 was, as you can see, in the order of $25. And although you'll oftentimes see graphs that show from zero leaping to 25 euros uh, at the start of 2008, that was, of course, what happened to the spot price. But you can see from the, if you take, you know, people expected the second period price to be fairly high, as, as you can see, and of course, then the other influences came to bear. Uh, third, uh, further point, emissions have been reduced. This is a very rough graph. I don't claim a whole lot for it, uh, but uh, what it does do is these are three lines, the EU25 GDP. I mean, it does show that emissions can be reduced and will be, a, will be reduced um, uh, without necessarily reductions in, in GDP. And so the three lines from top to the bottom are the GDP for the EU25 in this case, the in industrial output, the gross value added uh, for the industry sector, so what's classified as industry in the European system, and then ETS emissions according to the initial parameter. So the parameter has increased over time. So if you actually look at ETS, if somebody just puts ETS emissions, you'll see they don't decline much, but the parameter today is much larger than it was, not much, but it's, it's noticeably larger than it was uh, of what started out in the system. But we've got perfect, as close to perfect data as you're gonna get on emissions at the installation level, so you can identify what those are and track. And you can see uh, it is a decline. This takes you through 2012, the 2013 reports just came out, it's about 3% lower. But you can see, particularly since the end of the, of the Great Recession, of course, GDP and everything went down, emissions went down with it, but then there was recovery. It's not the sort of robust recovery that people would have liked, but you'll notice that ETS emissions continue going down. Uh, and to put it in a longer term perspective, this again, the black line is showing the track of emissions, what you saw before. Uh, going back, this is actually going back to 1990 as they've been reconstructed for the ETS sectors. And then the red lines show the caps, the first period, trial period cap, the second period cap, and the third period cap, which is a declining, with an annual decline factor. The red dotted lines show the effect of offsets, or how many offsets, there was an offset facility uh, involved, and of course there's a huge use of them in, in 2012. Uh, but relatively few that will continue to be used. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But you can see that the emissions are lining up pretty much with the future decline of the cap, 
which is here projected out to 2050 if in fact there's no change in the, in the cap, the rate of uh, the annual decrement. So if we want to talk about some of the features behind this and lessons, um, there, I'll make a few comments about the evolution. So this system has now been in effect for nine plus years. Uh, it's gone through quite a lot of changes, evolutions, uh, amendments and changes, and still more are being proposed and debated. And the key ones that I would uh, point out are, first of all, the evolution from what were initially member state caps to an EU-wide cap with what are auction shares. So you might wonder in a system, you could have characterized the early EU ETS as a a multinational system with automatic linking. So every member state had a high degree of autonomy in terms of setting its cap. It didn't have complete autonomy, but a lot of independence on setting its cap, distributing the allowances as they wished. Uh, and uh, that went through, that prevailed for eight years. But with the amendments that took place in, in 2009 to take effect in 2013, this switched over to an EU-wide cap uh, with agreement that uh, whatever was auctioned would be shared, the revenues would be shared among the governments. The second evolution was a remarkably quick one uh, from free allocation. So like virtually nearly all other cap and trade systems, they start out with free allocation to the affected units. And it was no different in the European emission trading system. However, a remarkably quick period of time, it evolved to where Auctioning was established as the basic principle. In fact, three years later, the legislation was passed to make auctioning the basic principle of allocation and complete auctioning to be achieved over a period of time to be phased in by 2027, as it, as it turned out what the legislation now reads, but with progressive phasing out, but a complete cessation of auctioning to electric utilities with a few exceptions starting in 2013. So all electric utilities in the the old EU-15 now have completely uh, have to buy everything at auction. And moreover, the, the residual free allocation is harmonized with it. So it's an EU standard set at the highest 10% of carbon, uh, relation of carbon to output for each of the identified sectors. Uh, and this is meant to uh, help with the, for the trade impacted sector. So electric utilities did not, do not receive any free allocation because they're not affected by international trade, whereas steel, cement, other things are. The caps have been, the, these periods have been characterized by increasing stringency, and I would note differentiation. So the stringency is the second period cap was about 11% lower than the first period. The third period cap is declining, as you saw there, at an annual rate of 1.74%. And associated with that, as the stringency became more, uh, more binding or increased, uh, there had to be increasing differentiation among the member states. So one point I would endlessly emphasize about the EU ETS is it is a multinational system. For those of us who are Americans, the European Union is not the United States of Europe, and within our own history it would be more akin to implementing a cap and trade system under the Articles of Confederation than it would be under the post-Civil War constitution and modern constitution of the United States. Uh, so this is very much, uh, initially everybody had a cap which was more or less business as usual and everybody had a great deal of independence how to allocate allowances, but this evolution continued. And it was necessary then to differentiate in terms of poorer countries. There's quite a spread in GDP per capita uh, between the richest and the poorest in Europe, a factor of five, and so there's differentiation basically along those lines. And then one of the less noticed and I think very important aspects has been the evolution from offsets to linkage. So the EU ETS is, to my mind, the only cap and trade system which we can observe which has had significant use of offsets, essentially because they delegated the offset the certification responsibilities to the clean development mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, I would argue it's, it's another topic that that's been more or less successful, but it's been highly controversial. And the, but the important point is that the use of offsets is being choked off. So you saw in the graph that I presented earlier, the very few, although a lot of offsets were allowed, roughly 13% of the cap, 
or of the allowed emissions. In the, first, in the second period, the 2008 to 2012, in the third period, there are many less, and the current proposals for 2030 are that there will be no offsets uh, whatsoever. Uh, instead, the system is very much moving towards seeking linkage. Linkage with almost anything that looks like a cap-and-trade system, I would characterize. So whether it can be some national, national, regional, sectoral, non-sectoral, whatever, but if it's cap-and-trade and has the requisite uh, integrity, uh, there's an interest in linking and most prominently displayed in the announced linkage with Australia, although whether Australia will continue its system is yet to be seen. But anyway, that's clearly the direction where things are going of the offsets initially, but moving now to linking to other systems. Let me make a few comments on the renewable energy policy uh, aspect of the policy there. Uh, one thing that the European experience has shown that if you have a sufficiently high fixed long-term price guarantee, namely a feed-in tariff, it will elicit significant deployment of renewable energy, and it has where those uh, feed-in tariffs have been offered, uh, particularly in Spain, uh, Germany, but also Italy. Those of you who have hair roughly the same color as mine may recall standard offer four, a very similar experience is taking place in Europe with, you know, you offer a lot of money, you get a lot of supply, and that certainly has taken place with uh, significant quantities. Uh, in a number, a number of the countries. The problem, of course, is always cost. Initially, no one exactly knows what the right price would be to offer. There's a desire to encourage the deployment, uh, but as the take-up, uh, if the price is set sufficiently high and the take-up is large enough, uh, the cost becomes quite onerous and it calls into question the political sustainability. We've seen Spain, a member state in arguably dire or very difficult circumstances over the past few years uh, for budgetary and other reasons uh, has actually had to go back to retroactively redo contracts as occurred in California under standard offer four. Uh, and even in Germany, which doesn't have the same problems, it's become a political issue and uh, there's a debate over who will pay for it and how it will be done. Initially, the argument, I mean, I'll talk about the 2030 proposals towards the end uh, in a few minutes here, but uh, the note, just as a, a notable feature of the 2030 proposals, there's, there are no renewable energy targets that are binding upon the member states, such as they now are in the period to 2020. So there is a question here of, well, what's, uh, I mean, this has been agreed, the commission is not politically naive. Uh, I think it reflects a general attitude that these that, that around that uh, these sort of supports have not been. I think perhaps it is, I, I would like to think sort of, is it a tough love, sink or swim type approach? That the arguments were initially economies of scale, you know, uh, learning by doing, you know, cost reductions. You don't have to look far in the literature to find all sort of claims of cost reduction, but of course the argument is we don't want to reduce the support price, but there have been huge cost reductions. So I think you may see the political system in some ways pushing back at this and saying, okay, fine, show us uh, that indeed that is the case. Let me make some other comments on the, uh, uh, before going to the 2030 comments of what we know or I think has been confirmed by the European, by and large, I would say the European experience confirms a lot of what we knew about the operation of cap and trade systems like, that we learned from the SO2 system and others in the United States. I think one of the new lessons we had out of the European uh, system is that data is super important for cap setting and free allocation allowances. So the European system was set up in a hurry because they essentially they enacted the legislation it was completely agreed 18 months or some, I say 18, effectively 18 months before the system started. Uh, it was for a partial uh, sectoral type cap, not a national cap. No one these sectors, the ETS sectors, had never been previously identified. No one knew there were no models that showed what they were. Uh, and furthermore, you were going to allocate allowances according basically to historical emissions, as it turned out, uh, but you already had big problems in getting the data. And the data simply was not up to the task of what people expected. Uh, so I think one lesson I would take out of the European system is get your data straight before you uh, you go about setting caps, which if you don't know what the baseline or the, if you don't have a good handle on what, we never know exactly what business 
as usual emissions are, but if you don't have a good handle on it, uh, you know, it's pretty tough to set a cap and to claim uh, any, anything for it. And if you're going to allocate allowances to organizations, you need data. This was something notably in the SO2 program, but comparison was simply not a problem. Although, when you talk to people at EPA who were doing it, they said, I remember being told by one of them that the 1985 data, which determined whether a facility was subject to the phase one, is the best data you can find on, on emissions, because that had to be, that was verified, re-verified, and people paid a lot of attention to it. Uh, the second thing I'd say that we know I've referred to already, which is expectations count. And I think that's important to think of why the price has not gone to zero uh, currently, or in, over the past two years, when there's been a huge amount of lamentation over the price being too low and everything else. That's a separate argument, but uh, we're in the first period proved that if you cannot carry allowances forward, that was, there's no future, then the price will go to zero. The price has not gone to zero got as low as three and a half to four, somewhere between three and a half and four euros, but people were simply unwilling to sell them at that point. And the people who are holding these are sophisticated agents. I and mean, they're not, uh, so I mean, it, it means an expectation of future scarcity uh, that I think you have to, have to keep in mind. There are several things I think we have yet to learn or we do not know, and I think the two biggest uh, I find is one, the relationship between prices and quantities. And so I would offer as a question, for instance, okay, we all know that the renewable energy targets overlap the ETS sectors and therefore will depress the price, but by how much? And I would submit, although every model has an answer for that, when you look behind it, there are assumed elasticities, you know, whether the sectors are properly modeled, I mean, there are all sorts of issues, but there's a major issue, and it comes in wrongly, have all these complementary, or I would argue supplementary, renewable energy targets had a big effect upon the price of allowances in the European emission trading system or not? If there's a great deal of elasticity, of course, you know, the, the number, we know roughly what the amount of reduction in demand, I would argue, is probably in the order of 150 million tons, maybe annually currently, 100 to 150 million tons out of a 2 million, 2 billion cap. So it's not a really big number of reduced demand for allowances because of these renewable energy, you know, injecting into the system. So how much difference does a reduction of 100 to 150 million tons make on the price? And again, I'll point, every model will give you an answer, but whether you can believe it, whether the empirical work has been done, those of you looking, younger people who are looking for good topics, this is a major challenge to actually try to see, because we really have nothing to go on. There is no kind of, there is no data to judge what a CO2 price would do other than what we find in the European system. So unlike other elasticities you measure, we can infer because of price movements and everything, but that's not modeling the abatement. And of course, one of the possibilities here is abatement is in fact proven to be a lot cheaper than what people think, and that is a major explanation for the low prices that we see is it just simply isn't as expensive as we think. I point that out. I don't claim that to be a fact, but point that out as a possibility. Uh, and the second major issue, and I think it's striking given how important banking was in the, in the SO2 system, is the extent to which people, in, uh, the banking theory has simply not been applied to the European system. Instead, there has been a notion of overallocation, and somehow there should be no surplus of allowances. Yet, if you apply banking theory, as various models have done, and if you do it theoretically, you will always turn out with a, uh, an amount of banking that would, that would take place. And actually, when you look at the sort of discount rates that perhaps we're talking about, although that's another issue, if you think low discount rates mean bigger banks, given the theory. So just simulations that we've done, this is something I've had people working on in, in Florence, you know, a bank between a billion to two billion tons is well within the range of possibilities. So potentially all of these allowances that are being held and not being sold at three and a half euros a ton are because they're being banked, because the future scarcity is expected. People are integrating over time, the agents are integrating over time, they know that cap's going down, no one expects the economy to be going down at the same rate. So let me talk briefly about the 2030 proposals before closing. Uh, this is, I said, the next step on sort of the 2050 target that's, that's uh, way out there some. 
This is the result. There was a consultation in 2013, uh, typical European fashion, typical public administration fashion of, okay, here's what we're thinking of doing. Stakeholders, give us your comments. Then the commission goes back into thinking about what they would do, and then they make a proposal, which was made in January of this year. So in the European system, only the commission can make legislative proposals. So it is now goes to the parliament and the uh, and the European Council, the Council of Governments. Uh, and of course, all of that is sort of stopped for the time being because of the elections, there'd be a new commission, a, a new parliament, uh, and so forth. But what is proposed is a 40%, the top line is a 40% reduction of greenhouse gases by 2030. So that's in comparison to 20% by 2020, so 40% by 2030. And this, it is said, would be EU only. None contingent, unlike you remember in Copenhagen, it was 20% unilateral, 30% if the international community, there's not any mention of that, and no offsets. So that's, this is not the law, this is simply a proposal at this point. It's a 40% reduction of greenhouse gases by 2030. There are notably no member state renewable energy targets. This is the big surprise, I think, in the proposal. And it's interesting to contemplate, discuss what are the politics behind that, but there are no renewable energy targets. There's an EU-wide target of 27%. If you talk to the modelers who are responsible for that and you press them hard, they'll tell you, well, 27% is the percentage of renewable energy that our model said would be achieved with the price that we think would prevail with the 40% reduction. So essentially, none constraint, if you believe that model is, in fact, will bear will uh, bear itself out. Uh, they also propose a tighter cap, otherwise instead of a 1.74% annual decrement, that it would be 2.2% starting in 2020, uh, and that there be established a market stability reserve, which is rather complicated, but it's similar to the strategic reserve type thing that was talked about in the Waxman-Markey and the U.S. debate, and it's been around, and it's it's, I would call it facetiously quantity collars instead of price collars. Uh, it could be a long debate over what it would actually do and, and how it would work, but the idea is it will, if there's a large bank that is gonna take allowances out of the system, and then as the bank is drawn down, it will re-inject them back into the system at a later time. Uh, and all that's governed by quantities uh, or allowances and circulation. And then the least noticed and potentially, I think, the most important part of this proposal is a new governance structure which is proposed, which will have national, I've called it energy plans, they're not called that, but it's, I can't remember, it's a long title, about three titles for sustainability, integration, and so on. But the idea is everything but the ETS was all this effort sharing. These are renewable targets and everything. There will be, there needs to be more integration, the whole emphasis on, and there needs to be more integration in energy and environmental policy across the European space. So member states will submit plans in which they'll say how they're gonna meet targets which will be set up uh, for that. And these will be subject to EC review, to the commission review, and some degree of coordination, exactly what that review and coordination is all left very unspecified. But the whole idea is some, Sort of. So I think in some ways I characterize the 2030 proposals, there's the ETS stuff that is tighter cap, market stability reserve, no renewable targets. Then you have this, everything else is lumped into these plans, these national plans, which would be submitted and which will then be the basis uh, of further decision making. So let me conclude. Uh, I think the first point I would make is that uh, it is a fact that there are no renewable energy targets or energy efficiency targets beyond 2020. The only, if there is complete deadlock in the European Union politically, the only climate policy which will exist will be the emission trading system, which is embedded in EU law and would require a super majority, not a clear majority, super majority of the, of the member states in order to repeal it or to set it aside. Just as any new action, People focus now very much on the 2030 proposal, and we could all have our opinions on how likely are these various features that I've just laid out for you to be adopted uh, for 2030, but, and perhaps none, but the system doesn't go away. The only way the system will go away is if it is repealed, and that also takes a supermajority, just as it would for any new action. So I think it marches on regardless. It's gonna be there with that declining cap 
uh, at 1.74% unless changed or until changed. If you believe, as I do, that trading is the most promising path to a global climate regime, of some sort of global climate regime, then the e EU ETS is the salient example and the standard. It is by far and away the largest cap and trade system that exists. It is a carbon system. It is a multinational system, I would emphasize again, uh, and the first cap and trade that is actually a multinational system. This being this example and sort of standard of how others, if you're going to think about implementing cap and trade, it's the only place to look uh, in terms of carbon cap and trade, and those who are uh, tend to be looking at the EU as the US did in the debate over Waxman Markey. Uh, I think they're very useful lessons. I haven't gone into it. That's a whole separate talk uh, from the system because it is multinational. And so if we're thinking of a global system, then that's what has to be, uh, it's going to look like the European system and many features like that. And last, I would say I think they're fascinating efforts uh, to foster like systems and develop bilateral linkage. I would note outside of the UN, although the European Union is a strong supporter of UN processes, uh, a lot of the action is being taken outside, of, such as the Australian linking is outside of the other discussions with China, Korea, and so on. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Then we will take a few questions and, and uh, I assume that there will be more for the coffee break, but we'll take them directly to, uh, to, to, to stay in the topic. Comments, questions? Please, I suppose. Probably we, 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 can, we can collect the three of you, just present yourself briefly and then and you take a couple of notes. Gunnar Eskelen, Norwegian School of Economics. Um, one difficult issue in Europe now is that it seems everything is on track. And for that reason, it's kind of nothing that you can do with emissions because it's going to disappear in the quota system. Uh, but just now, it looks like Europe is facing a decision of making the future quotas tighter than they otherwise would be. I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit about that process. Is it going to become tighter because it looks like we can do more than we thought we can? And is this a difficult decision for the EU? Okay. I'm Derek with UC Davis. Um, I'm interested, I look at the California carbon cap and trade quite a bit, and they've recently started linking with Quebec as of the beginning of the year. Um, I'm interested in if Europe would consider, you're talking about a price collar, um, if they're considering that perhaps uh, in order to link with the California system, because California has been concerned about having a minimum price floor in their system. So how you would see linkage between California and Europe. Hi, I'm David Lukotz from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, thanks a lot for a really interesting talk. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on leakage um, out to non uh, areas that aren't subject to the ETS, maybe in the form of uh, increased imports of, of manufactured goods. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for those questions. Um, on yes, I would agree, Gunnar. Uh, things do seem to be on track, at least as, as emissions. I think much of the debate in Europe, I would characterize as one, is the I often ask you, is the primary objective of climate policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions over time or is it to transform the energy system? And if you believe it is to transform the energy system, then this has been woefully inadequate. Uh, and I would be the first to argue cap and trade system on greenhouse gases is perhaps a very inapt instrument to do that. If the goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which may involve some transformation of the energy system, then you know it's uh, it's doing quite well, and I think like most of these systems, we see there's much less in reducing these emissions, much less effect and hullabaloo than what people think. I think because of you know innovation, I mean various you know adaptive measures that get taken. Uh, I think that work still needs to be done. I think the argument about tightening, obviously, uh, probably if 
prices today were 30 euros as they were expected to be five years ago, or let's say in 2008 or so, when you, you looked at the price projection, people with all 30 euros, perhaps they'd not be talking about uh, tightening, although I'm sure there'd be people out arguing for that. I think it is gonna be a very difficult decision. I mean, the politics are somewhat changed from, I think there was sort of a golden moment in many ways in European politics that made it easier to adopt the system before than now. The new member states, I think, are now full-fledged uh, members, uh, perhaps have a stronger, but I, I think this is characteristic of what a global system is going to be, how you reconcile all these interests, and that's going to be the debate which is going to take place. And Europe sees itself as a leader in climate policy, so, I mean, it still will be with the system it has, uh, but, you know, 40% and reduced a 2.2% reduction in the cap, that will have an effect on the price. So I, I do, I don't want to characterize, I think it's a very open issue as to whether that will gain the supermajority, and it's going to be very interesting to watch the politics of that. I think all those who are political scientists, this is really going to be a great issue. On the linking, uh, I think there's a great deal of interest in, in linking, and I oftentimes characterize, I think, as we saw in the linkage with Norway, that very few people, Norway had a pre-existing ETS, and as we've seen with Australia, that linkage provides an opportunity to redo certain parts of the initial design that you may not, you had to accept for political reasons. And uh, so whether Europe, and there's plenty of arguments in Europe to have a price floor. And back in the days when the price was pushing to 30 euros, there were talk of, well, you know, that, you know this is too high and whether they, there's a force majeure provision in the, in the directive that whether that should be invoked. Uh, so. I think that's a possibility, but I think uh, when you have linkage, the Australian system changed itself in some ways to link with the European system. Uh, you remember they had sort of a, a, a I can't remember, a minimum price type, type thing. So I think that would be once the California system gets up, everything I've ever heard from Mary Nichols, she keeps saying we're gonna get our system up first, then we'll talk about linkage. Uh, so, uh, but I think that would be, uh, you know, and obviously I think Europeans are very interested in linking with anyone, uh, and they feel very lonely in this respect. So, uh, you know, how much are they willing to, would they accept a floor price? There are plenty of people in Europe who would argue for that. Maybe that would be. The problem is always going to be getting the political system. On leakage, uh, this is the problem which has failed to appear, in my view. Uh, I don't think, I mean, perhaps not enough time has gone by. Uh, the, uh, I think the answer though, I argue the answer is more is, uh, I think there have been various studies of varying rigor and such, and there's work going, some very interesting work going on now, several universities and several researchers on getting to installation level data, so getting the equivalent of the U.S. longitudinal data in the various member states to really examine this question in a great deal more more detail. And at least the, the one working paper that's come out on that, they don't find the evidence. And as the other studies, all less rigorous, I would say, have similarly not found the effect. So the question is why? And I think there are two answers to that. One is, I would argue, it's just a price. The CO2 price is one of hundreds of prices that count. I mean, industrial production and location is what it is before you had a carbon price because of a number of other prices. And all you've done is added one other price on, a rather small one at that in many industries. And it really doesn't make that much, all those other prices still count. Everything is not on a knife edge. And I think the second is a lot of people are looking far ahead and saying, well, you know, the price will be 100 euros or whatever, that's not the price we're seeing. And that's probably not the price gonna be seen for a long time. So yes, if you had 100 euro per ton price, that clearly would have some leakage effects. But at the prices we've seen, which are ranging between, let's say, roughly five to 30 at the peak, so what does it more or less average around 15 euros if you took the long period, you can't find, so far, researchers have not found evidence of, of leakage to cause any significant worry. Thank you. All right, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Let's now turn to uh, another important region, which is uh, Asia and in particular uh, China. We welcome Jilang Jiang from uh, uh, Tsinghua University in, uh, in Beijing. 
He's uh, the professor and uh, executive director of the Institute of Energy, Environment and Economics at Tsinghua University, where, where he also got his PhD in management science and engineering. He's a, a researcher, but also a major policy advisor. And, and, and he represents the Beijing leg of the Tsinghua MIT China Energy and Climate Project, which on the other side of, of the ocean is, is managed by Valerie Karplus, who, who's also a president, whom I thank for having supported the organization here. And um, he also has a private hobby, that is to set up a cap and trade system in Beijing. And uh, we, we look forward to your talk. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you, uh, Chris. So, and uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here to join this very interesting di uh, discussion. So, and uh, uh, this afternoon, so my presentation really have uh, two parts. So, one, one part I will give, uh, I would like to share with you some of my observations on the China's initiatives uh, to uh, mitigate uh, the climate change. The second part, so I would like to introduce uh, the, the very recently released China Energy Outlook is a, a product of a five-year joint research project between Tsinghua University and uh, MIT. And uh, so I think most of the information